with us. Amen. Amen. For God, our Heavenly Father, loves us. Would you bow with me for a moment of prayer? Father, we come before your presence, Father. There's no one like you. We thank you for your creation, your creation of heaven and earth, Father. We thank you for Jesus Christ, your Son, Father. We thank you, Father, for the Lord's Supper. We told you, which tells us to eat and drink in remembrance of you, Father. And we thank you, Father, for there's great things that you have done in our lives, Father. And Father, there's no one like you, Father. And we thank you for your son, Jesus, Father, who died on the cross, Father, for our sins. And Father, and in, it, in his name, we do pray, and amen. For a moment, I just wanted to remind each of us, this communion isn't about a great teacher. It isn't about a great prophet. This communion is about God in the flesh. Hallelujah. That's right. It's about Jesus yes. who came to save us. Servers, if you'll take your places, please. If you'll find a server and take the uh, emblems and hold them, we'll have prayer together. And we do this in the remembrance of our Lord Jesus and what he's done for us. How wonderful it is to be together yes. as brothers and sisters remembering our Lord Jesus who brought us together. Amen. Father, thank you so much for loving us. Loving us beyond measure. Loving us beyond our expectations. Loving us in the most astonishing way. For Jesus went to the cross to bear our sins. But death and sin could not control him. He arose from the grave. And so this day, we do eat and drink in remembrance of him. In his name, amen. Take you to uh, Acts chapter 6 today. I've kind of taken you on a journey through these first few chapters of Acts. As we, as a church, as we celebrate this 100th anniversary of us being a church, and all the changes and everything that we've been through uh, as a body of believers throughout these hundred years. Sometimes, uh, and, and I tried to introduce this at the beginning of the year, we, we begin to think of church not exactly, I think, as our Lord Jesus depicted it. And so I started out talking about it with you that Jesus at one point says, I'm going to build, and I'm going to use his word, I'm going to build my ecclesia. We translate that church. But for us living in this present age, we think of church as I'm, you know, and I said it to you the first Sunday that we were together in this new year. We talk about I'm going to church. No, you're not going to church. We are the church. We're the ecclesia. As a body of believers, we've answered the call of Jesus to come follow him. This communion that we just got through doing, it's about answering what Jesus said, do this in remembrance of him. So as believers, we've chosen to be together, not because we all came from the same journey, the same path of life, the same family. We're all different families. But yet we come and we find this common purpose, this common goal, this common person, if you please, that brings us together is Jesus. And, and many times we, we live in a society today where we're consistently trying to put everything into 280 characters. <laughs> if that, if that, some of you, I know that doesn't ring a bell with. But we do. We, we, we message each other. We get on Facebook. We, we get on Twitter. We just, just so many things that we do. And we try to bring everything down to just a few characters. None of you are 280 characters. You're much more complex than that. You're, you're much better than that because each have been created in the image of God. But out of this, we've come to think, okay, I don't really need that physical contact. What I need is, is a message. And you're right, we do need a message. 
but you're also wrong. We need the physical contact. Last song that we just did. The words in that. I can't help when I hear those words to think about God reaching out, taking his arms of mercy and grace and love and holding us together. There's a warmth in knowing there's a God that holds us. But I cannot see God face to face at this moment in time. But I can see you. And it, sometimes we give each other hugs. Sometimes we give each other a handshake. Sometimes we just stand and talk. But it's about family. A family that functions together, works together. Carolyn, you touched me a while ago. Carolyn came in. Not something for the world. I never think of this as important. But Carolyn got put on a burden to take care of family matters. And some of that involved family possessions that had to be taken care of. And Carolyn said, can we do it? You know, can I, can I make some type of announcement or say something? And the first thing Carolyn told me today, she says, thanks to my church family, that burden has been lifted. Amen. Now, you, you say, well, that's so simple. No, it's not. Not when you think about what we have to do in life and how we are together. So it is being together, not just for a message. Christianity has a message, but the message is found in Jesus. And Jesus would stop whatever he was doing to touch someone. Maybe someone that was sick. Someone could yell out at Jesus, hey Jesus, and Jesus would stop. He'd look at them, maybe they, they were paralyzed and he would heal them and they'd walk again. Or people would bring their children to Jesus and Jesus would stop what he's doing. Always had time for the children. What I'm trying to put into words is what I've got on the screen here for you. Church is not a building. It's, it's not a, a video clip. It, it, it's not something that, that is just seen and not experienced. Church is something you experience. It's people together. People who are answering that great call of Jesus, come follow him. Right. And in that calling, it's understanding that Jesus laid out to love God and to love others as you love yourself. And so it is that touching and being together. That's what you're seeing in Acts chapter 6. I don't know about you. Uh, some of you have the same church experiences as I've had growing up. You look at Acts chapter 6, and what we see is a pattern for church organization. And we miss the boat. What we see in Acts 6 so often is, okay, here, here's the, the checklist for the church to be doing whatever. And you miss the boat. Now, let me kind of start out here and reminisce just a little bit more about these first few chapters. We start out in Acts 2, and there's some 3,000 believers. Wow, what a way to start. Uh, people talk about planting churches uh, and all the church planning that we've been involved in. I've never started out with 3,000. Uh, sometimes it's just me and Lorna. <laughs> and she got a little tired of my preaching. Uh, are you listening? I'm just going to make sure you're still with me. But you got 3,000. You, you get over to chapter 4, and then the, the number 5,000 is used. And then you get into Acts 6, and it just, from there, numbers are not kept. From Acts 6 on, it just talks about large numbers to the point that it spreads out, leaves Jerusalem, that first church in Jerusalem. It leaves Jerusalem and begins to, to go everywhere. And to the point that you get to a place like Antioch, and not only are there large numbers responding to, to the message of Jesus, but every social barrier is being knocked over. Because all of a sudden, it isn't about society and its places and its little cubby holes that it creates and the barriers that it's built. It's about Jesus, and we're all together in Jesus. But think about it. If you got several thousand people meeting together, you're going to have things that are going to happen. 
It's just what I was saying about Carolyn a moment ago. She needed some help. It's about helping one another. It's about assisting. And so what you find in the early church, they face the same issues. Let's take a look here at Acts 6. It starts out, it says, during those days. I don't know which translation you're using, but during those days. In other words, there's growth taking place in Jerusalem. We're up into several thousand believers together. Verse 1 says they were increasing in number. But you find that the common thing here for, for these first Christians in Jerusalem is most of them had this Jewish background, but even in a Jewish background, there was differences. Because some of these that were here in Jerusalem at that time did not live in Jerusalem. They lived in other parts of the world. Right. And so you'll find, for instance, the, he speaks of the Hellenistics here. Com, they were complaining because the Hebrew, uh, against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected. What you're seeing here is a breakdown that so often happens. In Jerusalem, there was a, the feeling of superiority. I live in this city of Jerusalem and I have the temple. Well, you live off in another culture, in another city, and so you're not quite on the same par as I am. And we see it all the time, you know, people begin to make distinctions. And there was distinctions being made. But what you're finding here, and, and I use the more modern term for you there in verse 1, the Greek speaking. The, uh, the most likely in Jerusalem, all of them would have been uh, speaking in more of the traditional that was common to the Jewish folks. But some of those had been born in another country, Greece. So they're speaking in, in the Greek language. And that wasn't always true in Jerusalem because they would have been using the Hebrew language. So all of a sudden, wait a minute, I do this and then you do that, so we're, we're different. Well, the church was having to deal with not only that, with this differences in language and so forth, but they're also dealing with the needs of people. Folks, this is, uh, you know, I'll just use a, a, say 40, when it's actually be closer to 35. It's about 35 AD. So what you're dealing with is there is no social programming by the government because things didn't work that way in that day and time. So widows, if they did not have an immediate family to take care of them, had real struggles. And especially if you didn't have a male son to take care of you, you had a problem. I gather from what I'm reading in this text, and that's one of the emphasis I made to you last week, was these first Christians were not concerned about whether you're a male or female. They were concerned, are you going to follow Jesus? That's right. They were not concerned about a lot of things that socially was concerned about. So the widows were accepted. They believed in Jesus, very good. But it also meant for a church family that there were people that had needs. How were they to take care of it? Now, and this is the interesting part, Acts 6 does not tell you what they were doing, but at the end of verse 1 it says the widows, that there was a daily distribution in I don't know if it's just a food of beaching needs, but there was a daily distribution being taken or being accomplished to take care, in particular, the widows. Mm -hmm. Now, for us living today, first thing we want to know, okay, how'd they do that? <laughs> I, I, need, I need to sheet <laughs> on what steps do I need to follow to take care of the widows? Well, it's not in here. It, you know, it, there's a lot of things uh, that, uh, that we do today based upon not because there's a, a laid out plan for us, but it's based upon the person of Jesus. He's at the center. And what did Jesus say? Well, to love others as you love yourself. So they were taking care of the widows. Because right. who was going to take care of them if they didn't? No one. Widows were outcast for the most part. 
So the early Christians said, we're going to take care of our widows. And I gather from this that there must have been a large number of them. I don't know what the number was. Again, it's not told to us. But what was happening was, socially, they'd broken down one barrier. Okay, we're going to take care of widows, which was not common because if you, you know, you're supposed to say, well, you got a family, your family has to take care of you, which had been the normal social thing to do. So that's not, ex but whatever was going on here is being explained to us that the early Christians had some way that they did a daily distribution of at least food to the widows to make sure they were taken care of. No explanation of how it was done. But what we do see is, well, you speak in Greek and we speak in Hebrew, so you get more than the other group. In other words, it's kind of like you're better looking, so you get more. Or, you, you know, you, you come from a certain whatever, and so you get more. So that was beginning to play, which was part of the social norm of that day. So the apostles, they, they, you know, find out about it, and the apostles immediately say, wait a minute, we're here about loving and taking care of one another. We need to do something about it. So the apostles call a meeting. Now, it's interesting to me that this meeting that's called, and I, okay, I'm going to rattle some of your cages, those of you that get into the details of some of this. It says that the, uh, the 12 call together the community of disciples. Hmm. What does that mean? Now, if, if there were up to this point, let's say there's eight to 10,000 Christians, you're going to call a meeting of, of 10,000 Christians. Do you know how hard it is to call a simple meeting of five people? But take 5,000, how are you going to get 5,000 together? Where are you going to meet? And, and you're going to have to serve them something or they're not going to show up, <laughs> many people. So what are you going to do? And, and, and in other words, I want you to kind of reason through. I don't know if the apostles were talking about the entire group of disciples here. In, in the original language, you can't tell. Now, I know what some of the translations do. They, they tend to read into that. But in original language, you can't really tell what, what Luke was writing here and who he was referring to. And whatever it was, everybody knew the story. They knew who was called together. So anyway, they, they have this meeting. And in the meeting, you'll notice what they said. One of the things the apostle says, look, we've got a chore, we've got an assignment, we've got a task. Jesus told us to be about preaching and teaching. That's what we're going to do. And besides that, and you're going to find, you probably find this kind of clicking in your mind, a little bit of music. Can you imagine Peter saying, okay, I know how to run a meeting for 10,000 people. Peter was what? A fisherman. Peter had never run a meeting before. Neither had John. Neither had Thomas. These are very simple followers of Jesus. Well, the Holy Spirit must have told them. Well, if the Holy Spirit did, the Holy Spirit said, butt out. Because he turns to the crowd, uh, the apostles turn to the crowd and says, okay, pick out seven guys that are and they give a list of what they need to do. They need to be uh, full of the Holy Spirit. Uh, they need to be a good standing. In other words, they need to have a good reputation because these guys have got to, to be better than all of the bickering that's been going on. And then third, he says to them that they've got to be wise enough to figure out how to do this. Right. Apostles basically said, this isn't our job. We've got to take care of them. And we're telling you that's what needs to be done. So pick out seven to do so. Why seven? Well, it's a Jewish church. In the Jewish mindset, the number seven is the perfect number. It rep it's the number normally referred to as God. The number six is normally referred to, to someone who is a human. And so each number has certain things in the Jewish 
mindset, what it means. And seven is the number chosen to represent God. So they were choosing something that would represent God that would be what they would see God wanting done. And then in verse 6, the seven are chosen. And uh, it appears all seven were probably just Greek-speaking guys. So they, they handled this kind of uniquely, the, this, this group of disciples. And then the apostles then, to give credibility, says, we designate you as the ones to take care of this. You were handpicked. People will trust you. And so you'll take care of it. Now, here's what's the interesting part. In today's world of understanding church, we refer to these as deacons. There's no reference to deacon here. The word deacon is a word that can be translated servant. These are nothing more than servants. You don't find any concept of what we officially call deacons until you get into Paul's writing to uh, Timothy and to Titus. But then again, that has some interesting thoughts behind it. All I'm trying to show you here is we, we go in looking at a text like this and say, okay, here's what the church has to do. It has to be organized this way. No. What this text is very, very simply teaching us, what are the needs and they need to be handled in the best way possible? That's all the story is. Right. Right. It's a story of widows that needed to be supported and helped and what's the best way to do it? And this is the way they came up. So it automatically, it begins to click in you, what's going on? That this is about doing what God wants done. Right. It's not about organizing a church. Right. It's not about organizing a creed to be followed. It's about meeting the needs of people who need to be needed. Right. Need, to be, need those needs met. Let me go to the next slide, William. Three things come out of this story. First of all, believers are to love God. Second, the believers are to love others. And third, we have to understand as believers that we're an extension of God's mercy, kindness, and justice. Hallelujah. That's correct. And that's going to be the basis that we're going to function on as God's people. We're not going to go find a checklist to follow. That's not what is being done. It is about people and how do I reach out to those people. How do I make a difference in their lives? And so that's what you're seeing happening in this text. So what I'm reminding us of as a church, we, we live in a society, for instance, next Sunday we'll have a corporation meeting. Why have a corporation meeting? Because we own property. And legally it's the best way to own, if we're gonna own property, to do so. Is there a Bible reference for that? No, no. We've chosen to do that. We've chosen to, to function in that way. And wh why have a building? Okay. We're not going to have a building. We're going to meet in the parking lot. So how many of you are going to show up if we start meeting in the parking lot and it's six below? <laughs> what are we doing? We're saying we, want, we need to do something to meet the needs of the people we have. There are no steps into this building. Why not? Because I don't know about you, but just meeting with, with a doctor recently, the doctor said, man, you're in great shape for a guy over 70. And it hits me, I don't want steps. <laughs> <laughs> I may be in a great shape, but I don't want steps. Why? Well, because I fall down <laughs> once in a while. What, what are we saying to each other? It's recognizing who we are. What are the needs here? Carolyn had a need. It was important that we help her with that need. Why? She's part of the body. That's right. She's part Amen. of the church. Amen. It's very important that we understand that it, it's, it's not about having a plan. It's not about having a checklist. It's not about uh, millions of things you can jot down that, that we talk about to her. It's about realizing that we don't go to church. We are the church. Hallelujah. That's correct. And this is what church looks like. 
We love God. We love others. And we become that extension. What is God's mercy, kindness, and justice about? And to understand those, we go where? Immediately to the one who lived perfectly, and that's Jesus Christ. Because that's what Jesus demonstrated. Mercy, kindness, and justice. And that's who we are. Simple lesson, but one I wanted you to, to think about as we celebrate this hundred years of being a church. Let's don't get go so caught up that we forget who we are and why we're here. And that's why I started out with the expression, the family. It's about connecting with each other. It's about helping each other. It's about supporting each other. Let's pray. Father, as we reflect on this Acts 6, we, there's so many lessons for us to be learned. But help us not to so look at this text in a way that it becomes something of a, of a format for us to follow. But that we learn what are the lessons here. Amen. What is your spirit teaching us in preserving this text for us? We see love, we see service, we see caring, we see kindness, we see justice, yes. and we see mercy. Yes, Lord. So help us as we look at this text, not to get so tied up in, in how our society thinks today, but help us to become more like Jesus and how he thought and what he did yes. in this life to make yes. a difference. Yes. For we too want to continue to make a difference. And we cannot do that unless you empower us yes. and we keep our focus on your son, Jesus. Yes. Thank you so much. In Thank the name you. of Jesus, amen.